Oh no. We just started. Um, roll call, please. Eva Henry. Eva Odoricio. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Here. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Yes, he's here. John Engels. Libby Zabo. In the house. Bob, Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Allison Hilt. Mary Vidham. Here. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Present. Margot Ramsden. Lynn Baca. Here. Roger Hudson. Ben Price. George Teal. Tammy Mauer. Present. Jeremy Fay. Katie Brown. Here. Richard Champion. Dale Christie. Rick Teeter. Becky Thomas. Catherine Whitman. Conklin. Here. Linda Olson. Here. Bill Gipp. Present. Daniel Dick. Present. Drew Peterson. Bobby Sindelar. Lisa Jones. Laura Brown. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Pat Norquist. Storm Glore. Jim Dale. Here. Ron Rakowski. George Lance. Stephanie Walton. Here. Dana Goodwine. Jacob LeBure. Isaac Levy, Elrod, Larry Strock, Present. Uh, Joan Peck, Ashley Stolzman, Honey Sullivan, Barney Drystat, Grace Palazuski, Colleen Whitlow, Paul Sutton, Sean Forey, Chris Larson, Julie Mullica, Grace Downing, John Dyack, Ellie Daigle, Dave Black, Andy Hammerly, Jessica Sand, Herb Atchison, here, Bud Starker, here, Adam Zarin, Bill Van Meter, here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Look for a motion to approve the agenda. I move. I'll move. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions passed. Next up, public hearings. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bob Pfeiffer, the chair of Dr. Cog, or Denver Regional Council of Governments. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on proposed amendments to the Metrovision Plan and to the 2040 Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan and associated air quality conformity documents. This public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all those or all who are interested in the documents I just noted to provide comment to the board. No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight uh, related to the public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to the board's decision making process. Anyone wishing to speak should have either registered on the sign in sheets on the table in the reception area or should have previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog website or by phone. All comments received via email, Dr. Cog website, or in writing have been automatically included in the public hearing record. Comments received prior to the, this public hearing have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please give it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those testifying. Uh, Derek Webb and uh, Jacob Rieger of Dr. Cog staff will now summarize the proposed documents. Mr. Rieger. Mr. Webb. <coughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for having us today. Uh, my name is Derek Webb. I'm a regional planner here at Dr. Cog in the Regional Planning and Development uh, Division. Uh, presenting along with me today is Jacob Rieger, the Long Range Transportation Manager in the Transportation Planning and Operations Division. Um, I'll be providing a brief overview of the Metrovision um, <coughs> related um, amendments, excuse me, uh, while Jacob will be handling amendments pertaining to Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan and the Associated Air Quality Conformity Determination. 
Um, before we get started, just want to highlight the, the public hearing documents that have been available uh, for the last month. Um, and Jacob did want me to point out to the Board of Directors that last month uh, you did receive a summary copy of the proposed MetroVision amendments, and tonight on your, in front of you he has included the summary document for the MVRTP. Um, real quick, before we jump into the proposed amendments, uh, I just wanted to quickly provide an overview of MetroVision and all of the related and associated uh, documents and plans. Um, Dr. Cog's MetroVision plan uh, kind of sets up the, the, the one up at the top, uh, really sets up the, the vision, the shared vision for the future of the region. <laughs> Uh, while we also have the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, which leans on and incorporates uh, the overall shared vision outlined in MetroVision, um, and it also provides for the 20-year vision of the transportation system in the region. Um, likewise, the uh, MVRTP, or the MetroVision Reg Regional Transportation Plan, is followed by the Fiscally Constrained Regional Transportation Plan, providing the 20-year affordable transportation system. And then lastly, the, the uh, Transportation Improvement Program, which provides for the four-year program of funding for those projects. Um, moving on, so we're going to jump into the MetroVision plan proposed amendments first. Um, and just to provide a little bit of background on the MetroVision plan itself, uh, MetroVision fulfills Dr. Cog's uh, duty as a regional planning commission to maintain a plan for the physical development of the region. Uh, the current version has been in place since the beginning of 2017, in January 2017, uh, with several amendments being adopted by the Board of Directors last April. So about same time, same, same time last year we were going through the same process. Um, a long-standing principle I'd like to point out uh, around this version and subsequent um, or, or predecessors to this version uh, is that it remains dynamic and flexible. Uh, really, the Dr. Cog Board makes minor revisions to the plan annually and major updates as needed. So during this current amendment cycle, there are three staff-initiated amendments uh, proposed related to the per performance measures that are outlined in the plan. Uh, really, these updates to performance measures were something that we anticipated um, you know, even before the adoption of the original plan in 2017. Um, really, this stems from all this talk about big data and, and sensors and, and uh, updates to uh, data science and, uh, and that type of thing. We knew that different methods and uh, better data would be coming up uh, that we could pull into these performance measures. Um, the slide that you see up on the screen uh, really um, highlights this, as well as the, the subsequent two that I'll, I'll go over. Um, this slide uh, pertains specifically to the protected open space performance measure. Uh, our open space inventory is one of those data sets that we're continually trying to improve uh, every year. Um, this uh, to put in uh, all of the data that, that we rely on for this, we, uh, we really rely on data from local governments throughout the region, as well as parks and recreation districts, and then state and federal sources. Uh, this last year, we actually heard from uh, one of those sources, uh, the, state, uh, the Colorado State Land Board, uh, which highlighted the fact that um, while many of their holdings are open, uh, open space, um, they're available for lease or purchase uh, for other uh, than open space. So um, in other words, the, some of their areas are not technically protected. Um, so taking this into account, uh, we've changed how these areas are categorized in our inventory, um, and we, we've, uh, which has resulted in a change uh, or an update to this uh, specific performance measure, um, which um, results in an adjustment of more than 100 square miles of protected open space in 2014. Um, because of this adjustment, um, we've also recommended that an equal adjustment in the future target has been made. So you'll see the baseline changes by about that 100 square miles, and the, uh, the 2040 target also uh, is adjusted by that same amount. Um, in terms of housing and high-risk hazard areas, uh, we also piece together a variety of sources to, uh, to create what we call a master housing data set uh, that helps with our planning and forecasting work at Dr. Cog. Uh, these sources include county assessor and local uh, address records, which are also supplemented by data that we purchase from members, or I'm sorry, from vendors, excuse me. Uh, this work is also aided by our regional data uh, coordination efforts around aerial imagery and the creation of data sets uh, on buildings derived from that project. So we can kind of compare and make sure that our data is, is all uh, linked and, read and, and um, available. Um, we also use hazard data, like flood data, uh, flood hazard data, um, uh, which is used in this measure. Um, and that um, nationally, um, county by county, has been updated uh, recently. So as a result, we've recommended a small change to both the baseline and the target. 
Um, and that target is really, you can see in the housing um, portion of, of what's shown on the slide, uh, it really equates to about 1,500 dwellings. And to put that into perspective, there's about 1.2 million throughout the region, so uh, we're talking a, a minor uh, percentage change. <clears throat> And then with this last staff proposed measure amendment, uh, we're, we're dealing with both new data and a new methodology. In the, pa in the past two that I just uh, discussed, it was really about updates to data, uh, better data, that type of thing. This is both better data and uh, a new methodology for calculating. Um, Dr. Cog publishes an annual congestion report, and prior to 2016, um, staff had to infer the delay um, by comparing roadway capacity with observed volumes or traffic counts. Um, beginning with the 2016 report and subsequent reports, the 2017 report, um, Dr. Cog was able to calculate delay on freeways using INRIX data, or speed data, um, as, which is an actual observation of speed and delay. Um, so an, again, another, um, a, a better data set to use um, when providing for this performance measure. So um, with that said, staff proposes syncing up with the annual congestion reports methods. And so um, using the most recent, the 2017 report is the new baseline. This gets us into sponsor-initiated Metrovision amendments. So in late October, as with the MVRTP, um, we released a call for amendments to Metrovision, the MVRTP, and we also accepted amendments to Urban Center, uh, the Urban Center element of Metrovision. Uh, this call closed in uh, early December, and at the time of the closing, we had about 10, we had, we had 10 urban center amendment proposals, seven of which were boundary amendments, and three uh, were new urban center proposals. Uh, these amendments uh, were subsequently reviewed by Dr. Cog's staff and an external um, evaluation panel, which ultimately prepared the recommendations contained in the summary docu document that have been posted uh, for public comment. <clears throat> The region currently consists of 104 regionally designated urban centers identified by 25 local governments. Um, it may be a little bit difficult to see. Um, the, the blue colored dots are, are you know, the expanse of our, our um, regionally designated urban centers. Uh, the purple dots um, are listed A, B, and C are the proposed uh, new urban centers, and the red dots are uh, the proposed um, boundary amendments. Um, see. just want to note if the recommendation that's currently uh, on the table and included in that summary document is accepted by the Board of Directors next month, the urban centers uh, will change to 105 uh, urban centers in the region uh, with 26 local governments providing that uh, local identification of those, those areas. Uh, this slide provides a tabular summary of uh, each urban center amendment we received um, by sponsor. I'm not really going to go into the details of each, mainly there's a lot of them, um, and they've also been included in the summary document that's been available uh, for the past month. Um, out of the 10 proposals um, we received, five are recommended to move forward for approval. Uh, these are the Aurora E470 and I-70 boundary adjustment, the Brighton Downtown Brighton Activity Center boundary adjustment, the Commerce City Mile High Greyhound Park new urban center proposal, um, and then Thornton has two, the East Lake boundary adjustment and the I-25 Highway 7 act, uh, activity center boundary adjustment. Um, in terms of the Metrovision amendments, that's really all uh, I have for you today. Uh, I'm going to pass this over to Jacob, who will uh, now move on to the MVRTP and the, the associated air quality conformity documents. Thank you, Derek, and good evening, everyone. So let's talk about the uh, 2040 Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan, which was the other main document that was the subject of uh, the amendments in this public hearing process. First, just kind of a reminder, like Metrovision, what is the Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan? Um, Derek already alluded to, it's our multimodal transportation plan. Um, it presents the region's vision uh, for our transportation system over the long term. Um, it addresses federal requirements, and it's specifically, it's one of the core things that Dr. Cog does uh, when we wear our transportation hat. Along with the Transportation Improvement Program, we have our, our long-range transportation plan, our Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan. 
Um, as Derek said, we identify fiscally constrained, meaning what we can afford um, throughout the region, whether that's federal funds, state funds, local funds, or others. What can the region afford to invest in transportation um, over the life of the plan? That's called the fiscally constrained um, component of the transportation plan. As part of that, we identify major roadway capacity and rapid transit projects, you know, major road widenings, new interchanges, uh, fixed guideway, fast tracks type rapid transit projects as part of the plan. Um, one of the key components of, of the long-range transportation plan is that it does determine eligibility for those major projects to compete for funding um, in the transportation improvement program, as you'll hear later tonight. Uh, we've said it helps implement MetroVision. Um, it's a federal requirement. We update it every four years, and we amend it more frequently, and that's the subject of tonight's public hearing is these sort of regular uh, amendment cycles that we do to the plan. So this is a table of the proposed amendments. Um, there's a lot here. It's actually over kind of two slides here. I'm not going to go through these individually, but I can summarize them by saying that the vast majority of them are from the city of Aurora, or represented by the city of Aurora, um, as part of their Northeast Aurora transportation study process. Um, they recently went through a, a really big process in their NEAT study, um, adopted that plan, and are beginning to implement it. And as part of implementing their plan, they asked for these project amendments to um, our long-range transportation plan. So these projects are locally funded projects by the city of Aurora. Um, some of them are changes in project definitions, uh, project alignments, um, staging of when the projects might occur, uh, one or two projects they asked to delete, uh, a few projects they're asking to add, um, but again, all related to their Northeast Aurora transportation uh, study process. Um, on the second slide, along with the Aurora ones, there's a couple from uh, the city of Thornton. Uh, these are really kind of minimal amendments dealing with, um, in one case, uh, slightly adjusting project limits, not really changing the scope of the project. Um, and another one, uh, the city is actually uh, completing a project sooner than was originally anticipated in the plan. So really just an administrative update to the plan to reflect that. Uh, finally, the last amendment there on this slide is from RTD uh, regarding the North Metro Rail Line or the end line. Um, not, RTD is not changing their schedule uh, for implementing the end line, but to stay consistent with federal requirements, we need to keep up with how it's portrayed in the plan. Uh, so again, this is more of an administrative uh, consistency requirement. Um, this is a map um, of those amendments, and again, as I've said, since you know, virtually all of them are either in Aurora or Thornton, uh, this shows, this shows the uh, locations of the amendments. As I've said, a mix of a few new projects, a couple projects asked to be removed from the plan, and then changing sort of the staging, the time frame um, of how the projects are depicted in the plan. Um, in terms of public input, uh, we've had a public comment period for the last 30 days. As part of that public comment period, uh, we took very seriously trying to communicate with the public, make these plan amendments known, uh, used a lot of methods relating to sort of traditional media, uh, new media, social media, um, direct communication, some of the methods that you see here to get the word out uh, about these amendments. This public hearing is the capstone of that 30-day public comment period. Um, and as we've already said, uh, we usually hold this um, at least a month before board action. It is important to us that tonight no decisions are being made, no action is being taken. We just want to hear whatever input there is and incorporate that into the final products that we'll bring forward over the next month. Um, finally, let me talk about um, air quality conformity, which is a federal requirement relating to our long-range transportation plan. Uh, basically, our plan needs to demonstrate, both our plan and our plan as proposed to be amended, needs to demonstrate that we meet uh, federal air quality conformity requirements. This applies to that fiscally constrained component um, of our plan. We have to address the criteria pollutants that you see listed there, <laughs> ozone, carbon monoxide, and what's known as particulate matter. Uh, we include the proposed amendments that I've shown you um, in our regional travel model, um, as well as modeling done by the Air Pollution Control Division at the state uh, regarding our regional emissions budgets. Um, the air quality conformity is regional, so it's not a project base. It's the entire plan as amended, that entire network of projects. Uh, we show that, that the entire plan meets the emissions budgets or doesn't exceed the emissions budgets uh, for air quality conformity. So as you've seen the last bullet that the plan is proposed to be amended, did pass the pollution emission test for regional air quality conformity. Regarding those tests and regarding those numbers, we do want to be transparent. Um, that during this process, during the 30-day public comment period, 
Uh, we had gotten an initial set of numbers from the state air pollution control division. That's what went our doc. That's what went into our into our documents uh, for public comment and public review. During the 30 days, we did receive slightly updated numbers from the air pollution control division. Uh, these are the numbers here on the bottom. Uh, half of the slide did not change the results, did not change the implication of the results. The changes are actually pretty minimal, um, but because literally the emission results did change very slightly, uh, we wanted to identify those changes and those will become part of the final documents that uh, we asked the board to adopt. So that concludes our staff presentation regarding the uh, proposed amendments for the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rieger, Mr. Webb. Um, the hearing is now open. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you have not finished by the end of three minutes, I will ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you do not repeat a specific uh, points made to prior speakers, a simple statement of agreement with a prior uh, testimony is acceptable and appreciated. We do not have anyone signed up tonight to speak, but if there's somebody from the audience that would like to speak, uh, please approach the microphone area, uh, identify yourself, and be prepared to testify um, as soon as the uh, preceding speaker finishes. Is there anyone who would like to, s to speak tonight? Seeing none, are there any questions from the board? Yes, Ms. Jones. Um, because we are out of attainment for ozone and we're getting downgraded to serious attainment, could you explain for everyone, because I think it's confusing how we can do modeling and add transportation projects and, and more cars to the road potentially and still meet our budget when we're out of compliance and getting worse. Um, and I guess the answer could be because all the projects that we're planning are going to remove single occupancy vehicles from the, the roadway, but I don't think that that's the case. And so could you provide clarity on that because it's not obvious. Sure, thank you. Um, so the difference is really sort of today's condition versus how the condition changes over time. When we do this work for the Long Range Transportation Plan, we're looking at air quality conformity through the year 2040 and in some interim periods staging to get us to 2040. As we go forward in the future with the modeling that's done, we look at you know both the projects that are in the plan, as Director Jones said, as well as um, fuel economy, fuel efficiency standards, um, fleet uh, vehicle fleet mix, other components that are part of the um, EPA model that the state uses um, to do this modeling. So the bottom line over time is that as the standards, you know, like fuel efficiency, fuel economy standards go up, um, as technology improves, um, as electric vehicles become more widespread and our fleet mix starts to change, you know, all of these things kind of add up together that over time we are actually, you know, showing that we can meet uh, these emissions results. Um, yes, that's in the future, and that's you know contrasted with the struggles that we're having today. It is it is ongoing work that we all have to do, um, but that's really the difference between today's condition versus 2040. Ms. Jones, just as a follow up, what are the assumptions then? Say, if we hadn't uh, adopted the LEV standard, would we have then had to change the model to show that fuel efficiency wasn't going to improve the way we had projected it earlier? I mean, how fine-grained is the model? I, that didn't come to pass, but I'm curious, is that the kind of thing that you would adjust the model for? It, it is the kind of thing that we could potentially adjust the model for, um, both in the work that we do here as these amendments for um, air quality conformity and the work that, um, uh, that the Regional Air Quality Council does um, on the state implementation plan for air quality. We're sort of constantly, obviously, reviewing um, those assumptions, those standards, those components. Um, and every time we do this exercise, we're kind of updating the models that are used to demonstrate these conformity results. Yes. Yeah, thank you for those answers. I had uh, the same question, actually, but to drill into it a little bit, um, you don't show ozone on that list. It's VOCs and NOx, but there's a 2020 column there. But in ozone, we're looking at serious non-attainment in 2020. So are we also looking at passing tests in 2020 for ozone? I'm, I'm sorry, Director, could you, could you rephrase that just a little bit? Um, just so to make ozone, sure I understand. Ozone is one of the things that you're testing for, right? That was one of the things you have to be in conformance with? Yeah, it's not a direct, it's, it's, it's not a direct sort of test. It's the criteria pollutants that create or cause ozone. 
And that's what's being reflected, you know, the, the, what we call VOCs and NOCs. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. But in 2020, we're looking at serious non-attainment of our ozone standards. So I'm just wondering, I understand what you're saying about the future, but there's also a column for just next year when we're anticipating being in serious non-conformance. So I'm just wondering how we pass the tests. I'm Steve Cook, uh, Transportation uh, Operations and Modeling Manager. I'll fill in a little bit more. The real key here is that uh, these are these budgets here. These are maximum budgets that we must meet for each of these pollutants that help to cause ozone. They were set in 2017 for, the, for a previous designation. Under the, that SIP up there means state implementation plan. So that was approved in 27, or it was fin completed uh, in 2017. So those are the things that we have to pass today. New, a new SIP will be done related to the new designations in the next, one's going to be done later this year, and then there'll be another one in a couple of years for the brand new standard. So, th so this is, based on budgets that were done it for 2017. So that's why these are still <coughs> old, even though there's new designations for which the RAC is working with the health department right now on doing the new SIP. So in, an, in about nine months, we will have brand new budgets that we will have to meet in future conformity determinations. So that's, it's, it's confusing. Um, but these are basically standards that were set three, two years ago. Confusing. Yes, Director Vin. So uh, my understanding is that the city of Atlanta, uh, one of the major steps that they took to deal with non-compliance non uh, with federal air standards was to commence the sale of what I'll call boutique fuels, which required uh, more refining. Do you sense that that's uh, one of the directions that the uh, Dr. Cog region could go? The regional air quality is actually evaluating that right now. They have a, a separate committee on, I forget the name of the, that's not a subcommittee, it's a committee on, on fuels. And they are investigating and evaluating right now different types of it's really the pressurization of the gasoline. It's called the reed vapor pressure. Don't ask me to. <laughs> but it's basically related to the volatility of the gasoline. And a few regions around the country have enacted this uh, type of fuel and required their refiners to do that type of uh, refining to make the fuel. And I'm not a chemist, so don't. Uh, but to make it uh, you know, less volatile, I always say, and this is how I explained it to my kids and when I explain this in the classroom, uh, you can't smell the gas as much. It's not as pressurized. They are, the RAC, the Regional Air Quality Council, is looking at that right now. I am not aware if there's been any conclusions uh, reached yet, but that is one thing that is definitely on the table. Director Atchison. Just in response to Mr. Vidum, uh, Larry, there has been no decision made that that group just started as far as one of the subcommittees down at RAC. But one of the things that, that they're having to look at is we could be looking at, if we go that route, the, the issue that California faces, uh, multiple grades of fuel required in different parts of the state. So that's one of the, one of the many things, not a thing, but one of the many things that they're looking at in that area. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, this brings tonight's uh, public hearing to a close. Thank you for any testimony, which we didn't have, and your interest. Moving right along. For item number six, report from the chair. The only thing I have is just a, uh, you know, we want to remind everyone that uh, your primary member, and if you're not the member here, your alternate can sit at the table. We want to make sure that only one member sits at the table, so when we take vote, it's a accurate vote. It's the only thing I have, so we'll jump right over to the reports of the RTC. Do you want to do that, or do you want me to do that? I want to say ditto tonight. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'll say ditto tonight. Um, yeah, I, 
I think well the action items that are that are provided today were were, were taken out of the RTC um, yesterday. I think other than that, that's probably it. I will will suggest that you may have noticed that in the board agenda as we go forth here, we have the two action items in the in the consent docket. That was in response to to a previous meeting. We knew this meeting was going to be a little longer, but if you feel you wanted to pull those documents at the appropriate time, you're 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 welcome to do so. Of course. Okay. Moving right along, a report from the Performance and Engagement Committee. Neat. Moving next to the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We met uh, at 6 o'clock today upstairs, and we approved three resolutions, uh, two of which relate to uh, the agency of aging. Resolution authorizing an increase uh, up to $600,000 additional from um, funds that we expect to receive to uh, the Volunteers of America contract for home delivered meal service uh, for a total amount of $4.1 million uh, current fiscal year. And a resolution authorizing the a, a contract with the Colorado Department of uh, Human Services uh, for the Area Agency on aging, aging to allocate and distribute approximately $18.3 million in funds for the period uh, the next uh, state fiscal year and uh, that was uh, a huge amount of projects mr chair i believe there are 84 some projects were submitted and and 60 some were approved from 27 different providers all throughout the uh, the area the last um, resolution was to enter into an mou with rtd and cdot um, to do sort of a triangular uh, swap of CMAC funds that we have to doc to uh, RTD uh, in order to receive um, uh, human services transportation funds through FASTER that were allocated to RTD and CDOT is helping us facilitate this. That's it. Thank you. Report from the Executive Director. Thank you, Mr. Rex. Chairman. Uh, let's start with the award celebration. It was this a week ago today that we're preparing for the event. Well, actually, we're preparing for we're, uh, for Bomb Cyclone Junior, as uh, as <laughs> Doug Tisdale called it last night at the RTD meeting. Um, it was a bit of a dud, too, by the way. But it, but I, I I think it it actually proved that. Uh, uh, it was a good idea to cancel the event. Actually, there there was two other events at the Hyatt that evening, and they all canceled. So we, the good news is we have a new date. It's Friday, May 3rd. Uh, you should have received an email by now from staff related to that, and we hope you all can attend. If if um, if you you know if you plan to join us, um, there's no need to take any action. We we expect you to be there. Um, but if you can no longer attend. Uh, please reach out to to us to make sure that we we, we know you won't be there. Um, but if there are are uh, board members who could not make that original date, but now they feel like they can make the Friday May third date, we'd love to have you. So please get in contact with either myself, Connie, or someone on uh, our communication staff. We 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 would love for you to be there. It's a Friday night, so we can make an evening of it. You don't have to worry about work in the morning. So there's there's uh, some value to that. I, I actually uh, you know, first when I thought about Friday, I was like, oh, God, that's going to be difficult. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, that's not a, not a bad idea. Especially so, when he has open bar on no, his Yeah, that's not exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a hand out there for you to, to, uh, to check out more details. A um, couple programmatic notes. First, um, members who are interested in participating on either the Finance and Budget Committee, the Performance and Engagement Committee, as well as the Regional Transportation Committee, um, there's still time to submit your uh, your interest. Um, so it, we're expecting those by Friday, right, Connie? We'd like to have those by Friday. And uh, if you don't, we're going to make some phone calls. We'd like to have some some uh, some new blood on some of those committees. So uh, so please, that'd be great if you. Uh, and a reminder that the inclined. RTC meets at eight o'clock on Tuesday before the board meeting. That's correct. So if you're thinking of volunteering for that board understand that some of you have jobs that that might be in conflict Tuesday morning. indeed yeah no doubt about it um, there there is no May work session uh, we, we just there was nothing pressing that we they, that we needed to have a meeting we are going to have a May uh, performance and engagement committee 
However, uh, in talking to the committee chair, we, we discussed the, the um, well, we discussed a kind of a schedule change for that. In, in months that we don't have a work session, I hate to bring you guys down here just for, I'm not saying just for the P&E meeting, but um, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I know it's difficult to get down here in the evenings. Um, so we're on those days, and this is the case for May, that we, we're, we're proposing to have that meeting as beginning at 5.15 on May 17th. So it's the night of the board meeting. So we'll, we'll run the uh, p and &E at 5.15 to whatever, and uh, then, then, uh, then uh, the finance and budget, then we'll meet at 6 o'clock. So I'll be able to attend both. I, that was part of my concern and angst. And uh, thank you, Director Stolzman, for that suggestion. Yes, sir. And just say, as a member of PE, I appreciate that change. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought you would. <clears throat> All right, uh, board orientation. I noticed several new folks on the board, and um, once again, we're offering an opportunity uh, for you to spend a little more time to learn about Dr. Cog. Or maybe you're not new, but just like a refresher about exactly about who we are, our structure, programs, and services. Um, we'll talk about Metro Vision, the transportation components of our of our uh, of our agency. The, the Transportation Improvement Program, which you'll hear a lot about tonight, as well as our aging and disability resources. So if, you're, if you are so inclined, we would love to have you. That, that orientation will occur in this room on uh, Thursday, April 25th at 4 o'clock. And sorry? Oh, sorry, upstairs. It'll be upstairs in the Red Rocks uh, conference room. So up on the seventh floor at 4 o'clock on Thursday, April 25th. We, uh, we would love to have you. And uh, we'd really appreciate if you could let Connie know if you're in, in, a, in attendance so we have a, have a good count on, uh, on participation. Bike to Work Day, uh, Colorado Bike to Work Month, or sorry, Colorado Bike Month and Bike to Work Day will be here before you know it. It's uh, June in Colorado. Uh, next, next Tuesday, Way to Go is hosting an open house uh, for station organizers and company coordinators. Uh, as of yesterday, we've already up to about 140 people that will be attending that event. It's a big deal for us, and, uh, and uh, people around this region obviously take it very seriously. What we'd like to, uh, to ask you is to start spreading the word within your own cities, counties, and towns. Um, we're gearing up for a great participation again this year. The event is going to be held on Wednesday, June 26th, and, um, and we hope we, you can help us encourage folks to, uh, to bike to work, encourage your coworkers, and and uh, just to try try to commute once we know it's all about behavior change and and routine so so please uh, uh, spread the word and there's a handout at your desk on that as well um, last month I mentioned that dr. Cog is uh, continuing our partnership with the Urban Land Institute to cover some of the expenses associated with the technical advisory panels in your community um, ULI recently solicited applications for communities in our region to host that this, these these technical advisory committees or TAPs um, and we're pleased to announce that two applications were selected. Um, and ULI will be working with, uh, with Jefferson County and the town of Erie uh, to explore planning and development issues in both of those communities. So congratulations to you both. Speaking of partnerships and opportunities uh, for further planning priorities in your region, there's, a, there's a, uh, a proposed grant, a solicitation out. It's called Active People and Active Pla uh, Places. It's a partnership between ourselves and uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. The money is actually coming from CDPHE, um, and we're just assisting, quite frankly, in getting the word out and helping with uh, the, uh, the uh, selection of projects. Um, these are really projects to help uh, local governments identify and implement community scale projects for, to, that promote healthy, active, and well-connected communities through short-term, low-cost improvements. Um, it's not a lot of money. It's $15,000 total. Um, but there's you know, a variety of projects that are eligible, certain, from tactical urbanism to wayfinding, some small, quick win projects. And, um, you know, tying this to, uh, to our uh, annual Bike to Work Day we thought was a good idea. There's no local match that's required. Uh, applications are due on April 26. And I don't believe we have a handout for that, but if you need further information, please contact staff. Reach out to Ron, Ron Papstorf, our transportation director, and he can direct you to the appropriate person. Um, I believe we also have, um, you know, we've talked about mobility choice blueprint several times around this board. 
at uh, various board meetings as well as work sessions. Um, and we're continuing to work with our planning partners to uh, plan those next steps. We do have uh, some hard copies of the full uh, report as well as um, kind of the executive summary brochure available today if you're interested. It's on the side table where the name placards were. So if you're interested in that, please take one on your way out. And uh, I, oh, I want to give a shout out to our director, Stolzman. Um, we do these monthly lunch and learns here in the office, and, and, uh, and Director Stolzman uh, did a lunch and learn on recycling. I'll tell you what, see, <laughs> I've gotten uh, so many comments associated with this, and it was, a, it was great education, because quite frankly, you think you know something about recycling, but you don't. Ashley does. So if you're ever looking for a speaker, uh, she was fantastic, and talked a little bit about composting too, and um, it, it, it amazed me how it varies around the region, what vendors will take. Even building the building in downtown based on the hauler, it, it changes. So it's, it, was, it was quite informative. So thank you, Ashley. Last thing, I want to share a little bit of personal news with you guys. I think most of you all know that um, I was born and raised in Canada. Hey. Yeah? I know, right? Um, and I've been here since 1992. I went to grad school, University of Kansas, Rock Chalk. We got any KU folks in the crowd? Yay, we got a few. That's right, Jen. I keep forgetting about Jen. Now you're good people. Thank you for being here. No, and um, I just wanted to share with everyone that I did become, I came an uh, American citizen on uh, March 22nd. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm one of you. I, I always... Um, I always used to kid with staff that the most awkward moment for me was the Pledge of Allegiance. Because I always, I stand at attention, I always, I, I even read about what the proto, proper protocol and all that was, but this was actually the first time I've actually, actually Ooh. said Yay. the pledge, so, so there you go. <laughs> Mayor Atchison. Golf. <laughs> well, now you have an even bigger problem. What? You have to vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. And actually, um, on that note, it's the, it's the first time. So my two daughters, are, uh, they're voting age now. It's, it's their first, it would be f their first presidential election. So it's the first three of us will be voting at the same time. Mm, so fun. very cool. Good job. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doug. Next up, uh, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are any additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues from a, for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items uh, will begin immediately after. Do we have anyone for public comment? Seeing none, we're moving right along. Um, so. Again, this kind of goes back to what Doug was just saying. Uh, we just moved a few things into the consent agenda. So we're looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda, which includes the minutes of the March 20th, 2019, attachment B, adoption of the resolution amending the 2018 through 21 transportation improvement tip or program, attachment C, and approve the eligibility requirements, criteria, and process for con uh, conducting the human service transportation set aside for fiscal year 2023 Transportation Improvement Program, Attachment D. Second. Motion, got a second. Uh, Herb did. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Moving right along into action items, item number 10. We're going to discuss some state legislative issues. Rich, there you are. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, so uh, we've got, I think, less than two weeks work, uh, worth of uh, uh, activity to go at the Capitol and things are really heating up. And uh, yeah, and I've got 15 minutes, so I'll, uh, enough with the introductions. Uh, but I did want to uh, ask uh, uh, your lobbyists, Ed and Jen, to give a brief uh, overview or uh, summary of uh, the budget and some of the uh, inclusions in that that are relevant to Dr. Cog. So if you guys want to jump in, and then we've got eight brand new bills for you. Doesn't this end soon? So in the interest of time, no. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Um, Ed Bowditch, Jennifer Castle. Um, today was day 104. Two weeks from Friday, we get out. Um, I kind of expected an applause line. <laughs> yes. um, 
in terms of the state's annual budget, the long bill was sent to the governor. There's a press release that I saw today that the governor will sign it tomorrow. Um, included in that long bill are a couple of items of interest to Dr. Cog. Um, there was a $3 million increase in state funding for the senior services line item. That is cash funds from the overage amount uh, that was not used for the senior homestead exemption. Um, the state allocates funds to reimburse the counties for the senior homestead exemption. If all the money isn't used, it flows over into the cash fund. So it stays for senior purposes. Um, they have a balance of $15 million. They're going to try and spend it down $3 million a year for five years. So this year, that th first $3 million allocation was made. There was another much smaller allocation, but important $55,000 to fund continuing work for the Strategic Planning Group on Aging. That was a bill that Dr. Cog led about four years ago by then House member Diane Primavera. Um, so the 55000 was included. Finally, as part of the House and Senate negotiations, there was an additional $100 million for transportation. Um, now, having said that, that was a one-time thing that is not the state's full commitment or multi-year plan for transportation. It's a one-time item. We still wait a bill that is supposed to be coming to be introduced likely by the Joint Budget Committee, haven't seen it yet, that would address that $100 million in funding for transportation, as well as potentially address whether the bonding question that was referred from last year's legislation for the November 2019 ballot stays on the ballot or not. So we're waiting for that legislation. Um, hope to see that in the next few days. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, so we'll, let's move right into the bills. I will start with the newest new bill that was as should be in front of you. Uh, was emailed out, I think, Monday afternoon. It had just come out and was already calendared for a hearing today. Um, and this bill, uh, House Bill 1309, uh, uses money, uh, no, I'm sorry, 1322, I was looking at my other sheet, um, it actually would allocate up to $40 million from the unclaimed property fund that would then be uh, transferred to the Division of Housing and the Department of Local Affairs to be used for a variety of affordable housing programs, including uh, construction, uh, home modifications, rehabilitation, rentals assistance, and so forth. Um, as I note in the staff comments, uh, actually now S S Municipal League, CCI, and CCAT are all uh, officially supporting the bill and testified in committee today. Uh, and the bill passed out of committee uh, nine to two, and staff is recommending support. Staff's looking for support. I want to. I guess we'll take a vote on each one of these bills. So, looking for a motion to support staff. Move, move that we support the bill. House Bill thirteen twenty two. Thank you, Director Jones. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstentions? Keep your hands up. Okay, passes. Next up, Rich. Um, next bill would be uh, Senate Bill 230, relating to the uh, creating the Colorado Refugee Services Program. Uh, this was a bill that was like introduced the day of our last board meeting. I, I did bring it up at the meeting, and um, now am uh, putting it. Uh, up for uh, recommendation for support. Uh, as noted in the summary, uh, Dr. Cog's Area Agency on Aging has a uh, elder refugee program and um, it would be eligible for uh, funding at such time as the state now would presumably begin providing funding for these programs and so staff would recommend uh, support for that bill. Staff seeking a motion of support. I have a motion. Director Jones? So moved. I have a second. I have a second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Abstentions. Keep them up. Okay, passes. 
Uh, the, actually, the next, let's do the next two um, bills, House Bill 1257 and House Bill 1258, because they're companions. Uh, and that's the, uh, re uh, related to the referral for the so-called debrucing measure that would uh, allocate um, any time there are Tabor refunds that those monies would be retained and allocated for education and transportation. And again, staff is recommending support for uh, both of those bills. Staff seeking, yes, Director Atchison. What you will see on the ballot is only one bill. You will only see 1257. You will not see 1258. That's the companion bill. Just as you saw refer uh, referendum C and D a couple of years ago, if C passes, D goes with it. This is the same thing. 1257 passes, 1258 goes with it. What 1258 does is just is determine how the funding, if there is any, is allocated and how to split up. There's also the piece in there on transportation that complies with the HUTF formula. Uh, there is still some hope that it will be changed on the multimodal to go from 10 to 15 percent. That's still being worked, but the 1257 has been supported by Metro mayors uh, already, and a number of the cities have taken positions. I don't know what your individual cities have done, but a good number of them have. Uh, CML has also taken a position of support on this particular bill. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, I look for a motion of support of the two bills. So moved. Second. Second, I do. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Any abstentions? Come up, please. Still passed. Uh, the next one is uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution 003, and that would, if passed, by, and it would require a two-thirds vote in both houses uh, to pass, uh, it would be put on the ballot in November, and basically, as it says in the summary, uh, replacing um, all motor fuel taxes with a uh, roughly equivalent uh, state uh, sales tax increase. Uh, the staff at this on this one is just is asking the board what you want to do. Um, we haven't had too much discussion on this one, and and uh, so we were actually just looking for direction from the board. Any thoughts, comments, Mr. Rex? Did you want to say something? No, I, and I was just going to say, and any additional information you may have on on this bill would be great. Yes, Director Fine. Thank you. What I read about it, uh, Mr. Chair, was that it would uh, substitute the sales tax for the excise tax, and uh, and it would set the, a different sales tax rate than the uh, general sales tax rate of the state. So when you go up to the pump, it would actually be a, a still to be determined uh, level of sales tax that would be uh, pegged to generate 99 percent right. of the current excise tax revenue. And so we had a discussion of this with our team, and, and I'm inclined to oppose it on, on, on that basis. But that's my understanding of it, Rich Adam. I think that's it. accurate. Director Atchison? Uh, I'm sure Lisa and I can both tell you, we met with uh, Matt Gray two weeks ago. He's talked about it. Um, I'm not sure how convinced he is it's going to go anywhere because of the, or removing all the gas tax uh, out of it. But uh, I would look to our lobbyists, and what are you hearing on the floor? Um, Go ahead. A couple of items. Um, this would be on the November 2020 ballot. The fiscal note assumes it would be a 0.53% um, sales tax that would be applied. Um, in terms of what we're hearing, um, I think it's awfully late in the session to talk about something this, of this magnitude um, when it's not even going to be on this November's ballot. I think this one has a long ways to go. With Richard that John. understanding, um, I'm going to recommend if we, if we do anything, we monitor this because the fact it's not even going to be on the ballot this year, and I don't see us taking a position on something that's not even going to be on the ballot until we see more detail about it next year. Richard Jones. 
I was just going to add that I, my understanding of what Matt Gray um, told us is that it's a it's a discussion piece. It's it's not really intended to be something that's realistically going to be passed this year. So I agree with Director Atchison that um, it's out there to, to start the conversation about different funding uh, regimes for transportation. I don't think we need to take a position on the bill. It's in no danger of passing. Thank you. Director Shaw? So far, I'm hearing a recommendation to monitor. I have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstention? That passes. Monitor. Thank you. Um, the last three bills we have all relate to affordable housing again. And um, I'll try to move, um, I'll take, we'll take them one at a time, but I'll, I'll be quick on the explanations. Um, the first one, Senate Bill 222, is often referred to uh, as uh, eliminating the prohibition against rent control. Uh, the proponents are referring it, to it as rent stabilization because nothing in the bill imposes rent control. It just removes the statutory prohibition on local governments if they wanted to do that. And so all of the local government associations are supporting this on a local control uh, argument that uh, it, it would allow if you and your community wanted to pursue that or some other uh, ordinances or, or measures to um, address uh, the high cost of rents in your community, you, you would have that local control to do that. Uh, so that one we are also recommending support on. Any questions or comments? Look for a motion to support. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Extensions? Hands up, please. I heard two no, I think. That passes. Uh, the next one is House Bill 1245 that is kind of an ingenious uh, approach at finding additional funding for, again, for affordable housing programs. Uh, you're all aware with the uh, vendor fee related to the sales tax, which I believe is, what, three, three and a third percent. This bill would raise that vendor fee to four percent, but then cap the amount that any vendor could receive at $1,000. And as I understand, the uh, analysis on this is that the only vendors that would get less back under this bill than in, uh, they have in the past are the large retailers like your Targets and Safeways and Walmarts and so forth, and that a lot of smaller retail outlets and mom and pop shops don't even get anywhere close to that now. So some of them could actually get uh, more money uh, as part of the vendor fee under this bill. And in the process through the cap and increasing to the 4%, it would generate um, several million dollars that uh, can be allocated again to uh, state affordable housing programs. Any questions, comments? Staff's looking for a motion of support. Do I have a motion? Uh, move to support. I have, a sec I have a second. Those in favor <laughs> say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Yeah, okay, that did not. So that fails. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. There's no. Motion. No, it doesn't fail. Okay. <laughs> uh, the last one is House Bill 1309, um, a Mobile Park, Mobile Home Park <coughs> Act 
oversight uh, deals with an issue that Dr. Cog has supported reforms of for, for several years now that, that haven't passed. Um, now uh, has been brought forward, actually initiated by our friends in Boulder County and Boulder City. I don't know if you folks want to speak to it, but um, um, uh, our staff is recommending uh, support. Yes, Director Jones. Um, yeah, we'd encourage support. I, I, I know from Boulder County's experience, but I think in a lot of counties, we have the experience of mobile home parks being bought out for by sort of large out of state corporations who are then um, really running them to make more money. And so they're doing upgrades and changing rules and regulations that end up forcing the um, folks that live in those mobile home parks, which tend to be low-income folks, often fixed-income seniors who have lived there for a long time, forces them out, forces them, if they're mobile, their actual homes, the mobile homes are old, they're not really movable, and they lose, you know, it, that, um, say, that equity that they've earned. And, and in a couple of cases in Boulder County, it's been really outright abusive. And right now we don't really, there's no enforcement of the Mobile Home Park Act, so there's no recourse to encourage people to come to the table and work these things out. And this bill attempts to do that, take a first step towards creating the sort of the leverage and the opportunity for good, better conversations to happen between mobile home park owners and the residents so that they can come to agreements without people being ejected from their homes. Director Brockett. Thanks for that, Director Jones. Yeah, we, we work hard on mobile home park stabilization in the city of Boulder, but w one of the challenges we find is that the Mobile Home Park Act is a state law, but you can only enforce it through lawsuits. There's no enforcement division, but meanwhile, um, at a municipal level, you can't enforce it directly yourself. So we've tried to add additional ordinances and it's been a struggle. There's often a big power imbalance between the park owners and the residents, and this would help even some of that out uh, through a variety of mechanisms. So we very strongly support this. Uh, at the city and would love to see Dr. Cog support as well. I'm happy to put a motion on the table. So I'll move that we support this bill. Okay, Director Begum. Um, Broomfield has been dealing, Broomfield has been dealing with this issue also and we used uh, Boulder's, uh, some of their activity and their ordinances and handbook as a source and we've included in um, our city and county a new ordinance and a new handbook to try to uh, provide some rights and some methods of the mobile home park uh, um, residents to be able to be protected. Uh, Broomfield does support this particular bill. We think it's still short of what it needs to do, but it's a beginning, as was said before. And what happens with the mobile home uh, residents is that they get short change because they are living in a chattel, not in real property, and it changes what laws apply to them and what protections they get. And the mobile home residents get charged for any whim that the management and the ownership seems to do, and it's like a cash cow for them because they have no nothing to keep them from... Uh, continually raising the rates or saying you have to put fences around your mobile home and then tell you a couple of years later you have to take them out and do that. It, it's to me a very um, discriminatory uh, practice that we're trying to eliminate. And it, I will say this, that the mobile home park uh, management and ownership seems to be at least a, an equal opportunity um, bias against everybody that's poor, regardless of race, color, creed, national origin, or anything else. Director Walton. Thank you. Lafayette passed a resolution to support this uh, bill. We have almost 900 mobile home parks or m mobile homes in our community. They're important members of our community, and we've been approached by many residents on, on several topics that there are limitations to what we can do as a municipality um, support this and I encourage support. Oh, Director Libby. <laughs> Director Zabo. <laughs> <laughs> Turn this thing on, but um, so it says that it extends the time period 
um, between the notice of the non-payment and the rent? What What is the time period now and what is it extending it to? I do you know I I think it's 48 hours now, right now okay. and it re extends it to 10 days. Okay. All right. I just thought uh, was that right? clear. It's 5 days uh, now and it extends it now. to 10 days. Okay. Yes, that's okay. for non-payment. So yes, for non-payment. Okay. It, for the for eviction it's 48 hours and it extends it to 60 days. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I'm also still looking for a second. Second. <coughs> Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. That passes. Is that it? Yes, th nice. that's it. Thank you. Five minutes and early. Seven minutes late. Seven yeah, oh. I was going to say too late. <laughs> All right, we got those done. Moving right along into informational briefings. We have a presentation on the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program Sub-Regional Share Funds Allocation. Is this where we're doing that? So each sub-region is going to get five to ten minutes. I should say five minutes to get through their list. Closest member to five gets another drink at the bar he's hosting. <laughs> so um, I guess who is it? Oh, yep, Mr. Cottrell, go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good, uh, good evening. Uh, so I just wanted to kick this off with, uh, with a quick summary um, just to really get things going, and then we'll get started um, going through um, each forum's uh, overview of their process and their projects. Um, in alphabetical order, starting with Adams County. Um, but first, uh, following late last year, after the regional call concluded and after you took action to place those regional projects into the draft tip, uh, Dr. Cog issued their sub-regional call for projects on January 2nd and concluded eight weeks later on February 22nd, 27th. A little bit different and, and frankly different from what we've done for every TIP cycle is the applications were actually due to each forum that we had created versus back to Dr. Cog, where throughout the month of March and into early April, each technical committee of the forums and each forum themselves went through a scoring process, deliberated, deliberated those projects, and finally made a recommendation that you see um, at your desk and also within this PowerPoint uh, coming up. That also included a ranked waiting list in case additional funds do come um, forward. Um, a little bit of uh, information regarding these projects. So there's a total of 113 projects that were submitted, um, totaling $385 million in Dr. Cog request. Uh, however, we do not have that amount of money. We only had a little over $209 million. Um, so through this process, that was able to fund 82 projects. Um, totaling a little over just under $209 million. <laughs> now, these 82 projects were able to provide over a, um, a half billion dollars in uh, total investment into our region, so that is also a good sign. Um, one more thing on speaking of working together, collaboration, working with your neighbors, uh, there was a total of seven projects um, that you'll see tonight that were recommended from more than one subregion, or funding recommended from more than one subregion. So that's a very quick overview. Um, I will turn it over to representatives from Adams County to start this process. That don't feel obligated to go to the podium, although as, as director, I mean, you're more than welcome to, to just speak, for, speak from your place if you like, but all right. Right. Good evening, Chair, directors, and staff. My name is Lynn Baca. I'm the chair of the Adams County Transportation Forum. So our member jurisdictions in Adams County include the city, includes Adams County, the cities of Arvada, Aurora, Brighton, Commerce City, Federal Heights, North Glen, Thornton, Westminster, and the towns of Bennett and Lock Bowie. Our 
Forum received a total of 16 projects were submitted for consideration, totaling $45,523,677. Our eva evaluation process, so the Adams County Forum utilized the Dr. Cog scoring process with modifications. The scoring scale was established from one to five points to provide clear separation scoring between the projects. Additional considerations by our forum include benefits uh, for a small community with populations less than 50,000. If the project was in a suburban connect was a suburban connector, does the project address a gap in existing service? Was this the next logical step for the project? And is the project construction ready? In addition to that, we had a robust discussion within our forum that. Uh, Jurisdictions of Adams County, including the technical staff, were committed to think regionally while addressing the sub-regional issues. Our recommendation on the scoring scale, so how do I advance? Hopefully you can see that. Uh, <laughs> I can barely see it from up here. <laughs> Based on the scoring scale and, addition, and the additional considerations supported by the forum, a total of 14 projects are being introduced tonight. All projects were ranked and funded based on the highest achieved score until the funding was depleted. Using the additional considerations listed on the previous slide, the bulleted points, each member jurisdiction that submitted a project has received funding. Our process for the waitlist is based on the highest achieved score by project. So in conclusion, the Adams County Forum selected projects that were both regional and sub-regional, which include Arapahoe, Boulder, Broomfield, Jefferson, and Weld subregions. The list also includes projects that are supported by Smart Commute Metro North, the Colorado Department of Transportation, and RTD. Included, including our list, the Adams County Forum proposed projects include six out of the eight sub-regions. But with that, I'll take any questions. If you'd like me to read the, the projects, I can do that as well. <laughs> so any questions for me? OK. All right, so we'll move on to a representative from the Arapahoe County Forum. Yep, uh, Jeff Baker here, Arapahoe County. I'm the chair. I'll wave so anybody that can't see me knows where I'm speaking from and, and, um, and for time I want everyone to do that that would be great to just do it from here right um, you can see the um, members of the Arapo County subregion forum just so you know there's 12 of those um, and that is 12 of the 13 communities that could be participating so we have one that did not participate and that was Glendale city of Glendale we had uh, targeted um, funding amounts of $44 million and $94,000. We had projects submitted uh, totaling $70.5 million. $70 million. Um, the selection of projects included ranking the projects. We had a technical team um, that, that evaluated those projects against um, established criteria, scoring from individual forum members, combining individual scores into <laughs> one score, uh, per, pro per project, comparing the individual scores, the ranking, uh, correcting for uh, or testing for reviewer bias, uh, meeting at the technical committee level to make recommendations to the executive committee, which voted on and created funding and waiting list. By the way, my, my co-chair is Ali Daigle from the city of Sheridan. We decided to have two chairs, um, one from the county and one from a city. Projects we selected that address regional and sub-regional needs leveraged funding from CDOT and RTD to the tune of $2.4 million and partnered with other sub-regions to advance the um, mission of the RTP and, and Metro Vision with multimodal solutions to the challenges being experienced. Again, we had 20 projects submitted. One was not eligible because of um, what just was not eligible for federal funding. We ended up with 19 projects that you see here. We are recommending that uh, 14 be fully funded. One, the second one from the, the 
break off between the waiting list. We had five projects that went on to the waiting list. The first one on the waiting list is a Littleton project because we did not fully, we did not recommend that it be fully funded. So uh, they requested 15.2 million. Um, the recommendation was 9.15 million. And, but we uh, put them on the first um, priority on the waiting list. Uh, that was a very large project in Littleton. So um, just to let everybody know, the project types that we recommended funding, uh, studies were study projects came out at 6%, capacity projects came out at 10%, transit projects came out at 1%, bike and ped came out at 24%, and operational uh, projects were at the overwhelming majority at 59%. Um, I think everybody's gotten a copy of the project, so um, email me if you have any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, so now we'll move on to a representative from the Boulder County Forum. So I'm the chair, but I did bring along the subject matter expert and the person that did all the work, and that's Scott McCary. If he wants to find a microphone. Just to justify you spending all this time down here with us. <laughs> yeah. How's this? <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm Scott McCary, Boulder County staff. I'll first talk about the process. We, um, we followed primarily the Dr. Cog scoring criteria. Um, we had uh, one member uh, scoring panel from any, any staff member that was uh, actually submitted a project, got to be on the scoring panel and you did not get to score your own project. Um, but, uh, and then we did also have what we called additional um, criteria that the forum um, wanted to use as a more qualitative. So the Dr. Cog score was the quantitative and then we had the more qualitative component of it. Um, as far as the projects, we had 23 projects submitted, $37 million. And I will say that um, $33 million was offered in local match. So close to 50%. This is probably a good time to remind everyone that as part of our regional application, we committed $5 million in sub-regional funding as part of the match for one of our regional projects. That was the State Highway 119 BRT project. And then we also committed $1.8 million for uh, State Highway 7 preliminary engineering. So that got taken off of the top. So that's the $15.3 million you see up there is after the regional money got taken out. Um, there was really only two modifications that the forum made um, outside of what the scores were, the, the quantitative scores. The first was we decided to remove US uh, 287 BRT feasibility study. That was part of our regional application. And we understand from Todd that that's now the first on the waiting list for the regional application. It's a relatively small dollar amount. So we decided to take it off of our sub-regional list and that opened up money for the second move that we did, which was to um, bump Superior up to the bottom, or to the bottom of the list, but to be partially funded. Um, that is a US 36 bikeway extension. We felt that that met all of the kind of qualitative criteria that we had um, decided for ourselves, and that seemed like a good move. So that was the, those were the two only changes that we made. Other than that, it was, it was strictly the Dr. Cog scoring. Um, I think that's it. that about does it. Any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to the Broomfield County Forum. Uh, Broomfield, um, we had all of our um, subdivisions uh, participate in that, but uh, unfortunately, we only found one. Um, <laughs> Well, we're tough. But uh, being the smallest sub-regional uh, um, member, we had an allotted amount of $4,694,000, and we um, approved uh, total applications of eight that equals the eight that were received. However, those eight also equaled eight million, almost eight and a half million dollars, so we had to make some decisions and I'll get to that in just a minute. But first, I wanted to 
have the transportation manager for the city and county of Broomfield just stand up in the back. Her name is Sarah Grant. And the reason that Broomfield has been able to do what I think was an extremely excellent job on this sub-regional and the whole project is because she was the person that herded it and made it happen. And uh, I'm not going to make her talk. Um, I threatened to do that earlier when we were talking, but um, I think I can uh, muddle through it enough to get that. Um, we had eight projects, and I said that, that two of them um, did not get fully funded. And if you'll see from before we move to that list, that'll explain it better. But um, we used the basic criteria that was provided and the weighting that was provided by Dr. Cog, but we strengthened the language in uh, the area 2A1 uh, to include what was its impact on the, the, the whole of the city and county of Broomfield. And uh, we used a scoring panel of volunteers that represented um, transportation, engineering, planning, public works, capital projects, and Dr. Cog um, for a panel of seven people. And the projects that um, are on the list are in their ranked order. And the two lowest, um, we also partially funded, and that'll be shown when we get to that slide. Um, the projects all support the uh, MetroVision Multimodal Transportation Safety and Improved Mobility Services. And the sub-regional forum reviewed this list um, and concurred and approved that. So if we, and there's this, the slide that I said that was coming. Uh, you'll notice that there, we ran out of money at the um, eighth level and we took the number six and the number eight projects and partially funded them to a um, pre-construction, which was really basically a design um, activity, and then we moved the remaining amount of money for the construction and stuff that we do not have to the waiting list, and that way we were able to um, decide later if we don't get additional funding, if we can do that internally, and if we can do that without having to federalize that section of the project and then make it a little more cost effective for the city and county. Um, I think that, uh, and this is just a comment, but the system that we've been using with the sub-regional things to do the TIP thing this year, I think is showing that it actually works and seems to be providing answers to stuff, though it probably does need some tweaking for next year or the next cycle. Is there any questions? If not, thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, so we can move on to the Forum for Denver. Thank you, Kevin Flynn. Who I chaired the sub-regional forum. Uh, like Broomfield, we invited the uh, subdivisions, and we had both show up. We had the city and the county there. <laughs> we, all, we also had, uh, as non-voting members, we had CDOT and RTD as members of our forum, and they were at every, at every uh, meeting that we held. And uh, we had a... Uh, uh, targeted fund uh, funding target amount of 50, a little over $50 million. We received 13 <clears throat> applications, totaling nearly $140 million. We adjusted the weighting that had been used uh, at, at the Dr. Cog level for the regional uh, applications to, to de-emphasize the, the regional significance because we were dealing with sub-regional projects. And then we added Denver-specific goals, values, and uh, particularly consistency with the, the plans in land use and uh, transportation that we've developed for our many neighborhoods and citywide, particularly Blueprint Denver and our comprehensive plan. Uh, three of our city agencies uh, were on the scoring panel, Parks, Public Works, Community Planning and Development, and Dr. Cog was the fourth member in each of those entities carried 25% of the scoring. And uh, we considered several uh, uh, Things in the recommendations, particularly phasing opportunities, prior funding, the availability of partnerships, and prior commitments, particularly one with uh, CDOT. Uh, we addressed several of the principles in Metro Vision, 
uh, multimodal connectivity, vulnerable populations uh, in the transit project on federal, which happens to be in my district and is the highest injury uh, corridor in the entire city and county of Denver, and safety and reliability with regard to the 16th Street Mall and I-25 Alameda. So on the next slide, you can see that uh, with that uh, significant level of funding request among the 13 applications, we, uh, one member uh, earlier said uh, that their projects had taken, had to take a haircut so that you could fund some of the other applications that had some timing and some partnering and other funding capability. So we did that with the 16th Street Mall, which is on the regional uh, list as well. And uh, the remainder of that was 10.9 million, almost $11 million. We trimmed that by $5 million and we are going to look for local funding there, particularly the downtown tax increment district, to see if we can uh, get local funding for the remaining five million for that. Transit speed and reliability on Federal Boulevard, that is the, uh, the uh, three million dollars was taken out of one of the items on the wait list, which was the rest of the transit speed and reliability, which totaled 9.1 million dollars for three other quarters, including Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Broadway Lincoln, and Spear Boulevard. But Federal Boulevard being our priority, uh, significant number of pedestrian accidents and motor vehicle accidents, uh, we wanted to concentrate on that one project because we also had uh, the ability to leverage some funding from RTD for that as well. Uh, the uh, other projects are uh, uh, the Broadway Station, I-25 Safety and Access Improvements, and they are... Uh, uh, that's an additional phase of the I-25 Broadway project, providing better access to the RTD station. And it follows on the, an earlier phase, which provided for the wedge ramp uh, to I-25 southbound. This provides access from the west side of Broadway southbound. Uh, it in, eventually, will eliminate the left turn there. If any of you have to come down Broadway at rush hour, you know trying to get on I-25 is a bit of a challenge. And this will, this will help us solve that. And finally, um, our commitment to CDOT for the Valley Highway uh, project phase two, the next phase. And I've been told that I actually have to advise some of those who don't have gray hair, what is the Valley Highway? <laughs> okay, I didn't, I, didn't under, I didn't understand that. That's I-25, okay? And this provides uh, for a new Alameda bridge over the Platte River. It provides multimodal connections to the Platte River Trail. And eventually it lays the groundwork for uh, a future phase which will have the northbound access to I-25 via a flyover ramp from a, uh, from a spooey on the west side of the highway and eliminate that Cedar Avenue uh, ramp to northbound, which no one can ever seem to find anyway. And so that's, uh, we put the rest of them on the wait list. You'll see 15 projects total out of 13 applications. That's because we split out the, tr the uh, transit speed reliability with federal and put the rest on the wait list and the Broadway station I-25 uh, to also took a bit of a trim, and we put that the remainder of that down on the wait list. That's it. You have any questions? You all know what the Valley Highway is now, right? Excellent. Thank you. So we can move on to the Douglas County Forum. Very well. Okay, I think we got a mic. Okay, we're going to actually share this for Douglas County. Roger Partridge, Chair. John Dyack, Vice Chair. So uh, as you can see, we have... Uh, eight members, seven were participatory, and actually because Bob Roth lost an arm wrestling contest to Art Griffiths, or Laura Aurora was not allowed to participate. <laughs> but we, as you can see, we have our evaluation process uh, listed there, won't go through it directly. We did have 14 projects submitted, 10 were chosen, and uh, six are fully funded. Originally we had eight chosen, but uh, in, in all respects there were four projects that took only partial funding so we were able to add two more projects to this so Larkspur actually got a project they were just tickled to death so <laughs> congratulations to the to Larkspur and and just a comment on Larkspur if you didn't know uh, Jerry Bean former mayor of Larkspur I say former he had stepped down and Larkspur now has a new mayor and I'm sorry uh, Mary's in, I do not know the name of the new Larkspur mayor, but we'll have to get that. John may look it up here and have it for us. But just a thanks to Jerry Bean for being involved in Larkspur. 
and it is Marvin Cardenas. So hopefully we'll see Larkspur show up. Uh, a couple of notes I'd just like to make uh, that what we really see, and if I, I think is really region wide, when we really look at Metro Vision objectives, we see that this opportunity gave us to meet that. And I think a lot of the projects that we see in all the regions did that a very good job. The other th observation is that we as elected officials, uh, we're policy people, no doubt. We do make the final decision on the tip. But what this really taught us, I think, is the process that is involved here. And really a shout goes out to the technical working group, all of our staffs, the Dr. Cog staffs, because I think they really educated us in this process so we really get an idea of all the criteria, all the different colors of money, and what it takes to get this figured out. So I think it's a real shout out to them. And if it's okay, I think we ought to give them an applause. All right, uh, I do the evaluation. We, we primarily used uh, the, the Dr. Cog method. We just uh, uh, really focused on leveraging. We kind of uh, elevated that in our, in our calculation. Uh, there was focused on selecting critical multimodal projects, address the current and future travel demands, regional connectivity, and sustainable and healthy communities in the region. Um, uh, Commissioner, or Director Partridge uh, just wanted me to, to, to note that we are the number one, uh, the, the healthiest uh, county, I believe, in the, in the U.S. So um, that's, that's great. Um, technical committee agreed to uh, the base final project selection on an average ranking. Um, again, we, we had unanimous support at, at all phases of, um, of the entire process. Uh, and as Director Partridge indicated, it was a very collaborative process. Um, we felt that um, we kind of took the competitive uh, part of it and made it collaborative. Um, that, taking a look at our project selections, um, we had two, um, two inner uh, sub-regional projects. We, we worked with uh, with Littleton, and we worked with Arapahoe County to do two projects. Um, we, we leveraged CDOT with their funding, um, worked on multimodal, and again, everybody um, took a haircut on some projects so we can get more projects in. So we, we used uh, primarily the, the Dr. Cog money first, and then the, the last couple of projects were more SB1. Uh, we had more than enough projects to uh, to uh, look at to to use all of the funding, so I think all in all, uh, we had a pretty successful uh, sub-regional process. Any questions? Great, um, Jefferson County Forum. Hello, I'm Libby Zabel. I'm way in the back over here, and I just um, want to um, also say our group was so collaborative, our Jefferson County group. Um, I don't think we argued about one thing or fought about one thing. We kind of came together and realized what's going to be good for Jefferson County that will also influence the rest of the region. And we came up with some good projects. Um, our foreign forum members included us, of course, Arvada, Edgewater, Golden, Lakewood, Littleton, Superior, Westminster, and Wheat Ridge. And I want to give a shout out to all the mayors and city councilmen from there who um, showed up to all the meetings. We had a lot of meetings and um, gave great input. And also um, Nancy York from our Open Space Department and Steve Durian are here to, uh, if I mess up, they'll, they'll fix it. And so um, our target amount was around 32 million. We had 12 applications. Um, we, were see we received at a amount of 36 million. 11 of those were chosen. Our uh, forums technical committee were the folks who received and recommended the options and why they choose, chose those particular ones. So the tech committee consisted of um, our forum member communities, CDOT and Dr. Cog, and they were a great help to us in selecting them. Just to, like what Roger said, a shout out to all the ancillary help that we were able to get. Um, recommendations were based on Dr. Cog's regional scoring criteria 
The lowest sco scoring project was moved to the wait list. As you can see, I don't know where our little thing is up there. I have a big one though, because I couldn't read that little thing they gave me. <laughs> and I didn't want you guys to see me with my readers on. <laughs> Those are for at home. Uh, the forum met and discussed the merits of each option and why they selected what they did. And the, the projects were selected that, you know, stood out were clearly met with the Metro Visions goals related to urban centers, multimodal improvements, and access to outdoor amenities. There are a few uh, open space projects on there that I believe all of you will be able to um, use at one point. The Peaks to Plains project is one I think in Jefferson County we're all very proud of. And the rest of them are, um, you know, kind of spread out, all kind of different genres of uh, transportation needs. Um, whether you're in a car, whether you're on a bike, or whether you take bus 11, um, you can, um, you know, uh, figure out something. So overall, it was a great process. I was a little scared going into it, and when they asked me to be chair, I was worried, but my group was great. <laughs> I mean, they were just very cooperative, and I appreciate you all. Thank you. Any questions? All right, so we move on to Southwest Weld County. Good evening, Chair uh, Pfeiffer and the directors. My name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planner and uh, Manager for the City of Longmont. I'm here uh, in place of Laura Brown, who's your fellow director, and she's not able to make it tonight because she has a family emergency. So when you see her next month, uh, please wish her well and hope that everything's okay with her family. Um, I do have a confession to make tonight. I'm actually a former Dr. Cog employee uh, from about 25 plus years ago. And so I was involved in some of the TIP processes back then. And I'll tell you that this is much, much more open and, uh, and broader and, and more transparent than anything that we used to do back then. I hate to say that. I don't want to give too much away. But we, this, this process, we went in with a little trepidation, like was mentioned before. And it's really been something that's been I think we can really be proud of as, as the entire, all the subregions, and, and you've heard it tonight. So I just wanted to thank the vision of the board for really embracing this new um, um, subregion process, the, the leadership of, of Doug Rex, and really pushing this forward and getting his staff out there. And they were at every one of our meetings. I think everyone can say that they saw the staff at each one, especially Todd Cottrell and Ron Papstorf really came to and helped us out through the process. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we really couldn't have done it without those folks and without you. Um, our projects in Southwest Weld County were basically a couple of greenway trails, a bicycle and pedestrian bridge, an underpass, um, some interchange improvements. Uh, and where we couldn't make all the, all the different projects, uh, actually, uh, we couldn't fully fund all seven of the projects that were submitted to our group. Uh, we had $6 million and $55,000 to spend total for Southwest Weld. Uh, we were able to s at least fund partially all the projects, and so we're pretty proud of that as well. So um, we have a few, few on the wait list that need to wait for some money there, but uh, we basically used the Dr. Cog scoring process and basically ranked those projects the way they were through Dr. Cog and went after each one of those as they ranked. Uh, our desire was really to get as many jurisdictions a portion of the federal dollars as possible, and I think we achieved that. So thank you again. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I, have a, I do have a few remaining um, kind of closing slides um, for your consideration. So now that we have a, a, at least the forums have made a recommendation in terms of the sub-regional projects, though we don't have an official uh, board action for the, to put these projects into the draft tip. Um, now's a good time to take a look at combining both the regional and the sub-regional share projects. So this pie chart outlines the funding allocation by project type. Um, so just a couple things really to point out. Um, first of all, uh, for this tip cycle, we are introducing a new project type called multimodal. Um, so multimodal is essentially when you have two or more project elements of uh, bike pad, transit, and BRT. So this will help a little bit in distinguishing between 
you know, project types that contain multiple elements. Um, so that's the first. Uh, second is within the bike and the ped. And we see, we see what we have a total of $51.7 million spread, again, over the regional and the sub-regional call. So this is approximately 10 to $15 million more than the last couple tips. Um, so that's, that's very helpful. Um, another thing to point out is between the, the roadway types. Um, that's approximately in the same range of what we've had, again, the last couple tips. When we break this down into percentage of projects by type, a um, couple things to note. Um, again, bike and ped, um, it's slated at 30%. Um, this is higher than we've had historically. It's usually right around 20 to 21%. Um, and then when you combine the bike and ped with the transit and multimodal, um, that comes in at 50%. So I would say that's, that's definitely higher than what we've ever had in the past. Um, at your desk should be a map. This is, again, just for those who like to see things visually. Um, you can take that with you and uh, be happy with that. I think that shows a good cross um, selection of projects. And finally, just kind of a remaining schedule and what we have left. Um, so coming up um, this month through TAC, RTC, and the board, we'll be looking for the recommendation and action to place the sub-regional projects into the draft tip. Um, during that time, staff will be compiling the actual tip document to uh, prepare that uh, for the middle of June to open the public comment um, to release not only the draft tip, but also the conformity documents. At your July board meeting, uh, you'll have a public hearing on the TIP and the conformity documents. Um, and then we'll go right into the recommendation and action to approve the actual TIP and conformity documents concluding in August. So that's kind of where we are coming up. We're, we're right at the end. And uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have, whether on something that was in this presentation or if any of the other projects that, that you see uh, that you heard about tonight. Any questions or comments? Yes, Director Walton. Thank you. I was wondering how the wait list um, projects would be working for the subregions. If you could just review that process, please. Yes, so if there is new funding identified that does come into Dr. Cog after the TIP is adopted, it will be split essentially 20% to the regional share and 80% to the subregions. And then that 80% will further divide down into the eight individual subregions. After that, there'll be a certain amount that will be allocated towards each, each forum. Um, and then when we get to a approximate $2 million mark, or if the first project on the waiting list is lower than that, um, we will have conversations with that project sponsor and um, go through the process to try to put that into the actual tip. Director Elrod. Now is it working? Yes, it is. Um, in August, uh, will we will that be presented um, by years as well when the funding will be provided? Is that yes. what we will be looking yep. at? And you will actually see that in the middle of June when the public comment draft is released. Director Stolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Was the staff able to evaluate if everyone who wanted state funding was able to get it at this point? We are going through that process right now. Yep. Any other questions? Director Brockett. So uh, these pie charts are really great. Would you mind uh, emailing those to us at some point for a reference? Certainly. Thank you. Any more? How quick we did that? Guess who owes everyone a drink? <laughs> a third is going to be fun, fun, fun. First, first and foremost, I'll, I'll have to echo Director Partridge's comments on staff. For those that sit in multiple regions or even aware of other regions, staff has spent long days, long months. Is it a year yet? Years. I was going to say, yeah, in this new process. And I couldn't, you know, thank them enough for their their steadfast approach, you know, 
tiring days, but still kept uh, a spring in their step. <coughs> so I would like to echo uh, Director Partridge's uh, comments, and let's give another round of applause to that staff. <laughs> Secondly, I want to thank all of you and your subregions because this is the first time we went to uncharted territory, some with you know concerns and skeptical opinions. And at the end of the day, the outcomes, I think, uh, were perfect, if not very close to perfect. How we got there were all different, but it, 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 it showed collaboration at a different level and at a, um, I would say, even a micro level, um, because even communities within the subregion were collaborating at a level that we probably have never seen at this uh, forum before. So I want to give all of you a round of applause for, for doing this and getting through this and your staff. All righty, so we can either sit here till 9.45 or keep oh. moving on. No, that's Libby. Is that Libby back there? That's me. Let's go. Director, who's in the house? <laughs> the um, house? Committee reports. Let's hear from Stack, uh, Director Jones. So uh, three major things from the March 22nd Stack meeting. One, we get a presentation from the CDOT Director, Shoshana Liu, and the new Director of Transportation Development, Rebecca White, about their plans for basically updating um, the CDOT planning process. They're calling it a planning reset. And the goals of that are to integrate the different modal plans, like the transit plan and the statewide plan, um, to use sort of new and improved modeling. They have access to better data now. And to basically leverage the, the statewide planning process to deliver a 10-year what they're calling a strategic pipeline of projects. So instead of just having a four-year rolling stip, you'd have a four-year stip with an additional six years of prioritized projects. So, you know, we'll wait and see how it goes, but uh, it sounds like it could have some promise. Um, we also heard from uh, Colorado Wildlife, or CBW and CDOT, um, they did a Colorado Wildlife and Transportation Alliance um, to work on vehicle wildlife crashes. And they did, because 60% of the crashes, those crashes are on the West Slope, they did a prioritization study there to look at mitigation measures that could be taken. So um, they're feeling pretty confident about those uh, mitigation measures and there's an opportunity to then replicate them in um, all the different planning regions around the state where wildlife crashes are a problem. And it's worth noting that it costs the state, state $66 million annually. So these crashes are a big deal, not to mention the fact that people get hurt. And it doesn't do a lot for the wildlife either. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we got an update on the Federal Lands Access Program, or FLAP, which, as you probably know, provides funds for transportation improvements to access federal lands, particularly recreational um, lands. The Colorado call for project is projects for FLAP grants is open now. It's open until June 5th. And Colorado gets approximately $15 million that will be distributed. So that's something for communities to be aware of. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, Director Atchison on the Metro Mayors. I mean, just a couple of things from the last uh, Metro Mayors Caucus. One is we've continued to try to deal with what's happening at the legislature, and we can't keep up with it. Honestly, with bills being dropped one day and committee hearings the following or two days later, it's tough to monitor what all's going on. So first of all, for Jennifer and Ed, the fact that they have to stay down there all the time, it's a blessing on them and not us. But I think one of the things that we're all trying to do is figure out what's happening at the legislature. We're, we're still getting bills dropping today, and we've got less than three weeks left. The other piece that uh, Metro Mayors, along with the county commissioners and uh, the Dr. Cog staff, has continued to look at the discussion we had at the last board meeting on transportation funding options, uh, where that might go, where it may not go, whether or not to try to introduce that into the legislature this year, and the decision was not at this point. Uh, so at best, we will probably look at something coming forward maybe next year with a follow-on for something, uh, if we can, and goes back to the... Uh, option of us using Dr. Cog as a funnel for funds for buying the regions 
of which there are six in the state, which would still give us something of a state. But clearly, we are very st much still in the early stages of discussion. Uh, it takes a number of uh, steps to get the bills introduced and get it passed. And then you still have to deal with the referred measure or tax measure in your different communities and counties if it goes anywhere. So that will continue to be monitored for probably, I'm going to say, at least another year before we get to that. Other than that, it's trying to figure out how we get to work every day. All righty. time. Thank you very much, Director Atchison. Uh, the Metro Area County Commissioners, uh, Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, actually, the Metro Area County Commissioners may not keep up with the state legislature because we actually need to make a decision. We will not discuss legislation. But in all respects, uh, Director Atchison, thank you so much for everything you do for keeping up with the legislature as well as you do and, and keep Metro mayors on top of it. Uh, with we actually, at our last meeting, we looked at Aero and Aero Space, and we had presentations from Adams County regarding their spaceport to look at the impacts on, the, on that community and on the whole region about spaceport. So wonderful presentation, and it's really great to see how much aerospace in Colorado is is really present here. I think we're the number two in the country for that. So it's really great to hear that. And then Rapo County giving a presentation on Centennial Airport, the second busiest general aviation airport in the country. So the economic impact, but just the, the convenience that we have with those kind of uh, services here is phenomenal. Oops. Thank you very much, Director Partridge. Uh, Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Jayla Sanchez Warren. We have not had our meeting. It's on Friday, so no report. Thank you. Uh, Director, or excuse me, uh, Doug Rex for the Regional Air Quality Council. Great. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, we took our show on the road last month. Um, we, um, we had our meeting up in Loveland. Um, and really, the program was really set to we had several presentations that just kind of illustrated some of the work they're doing on the North Front Range uh, associated with uh, mitigating air quality uh, issues, obviously, up there as well. So it was, it was well attended. We did carpool, so if anybody was wondering <laughs> about that, we did carpool, so we're good. No bike ride, though, no. <laughs> Should talk about it. No. So, okay, so sorry. Sidebar there. Uh, reports on E470 Authority, Director Dyack. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Director Parch and myself were jogging to see who was going to give this report, and we forgot that Director Teal was on the phone. So uh, I will continue, but just wanted to make note that Direct Director Teal was in attendance. Uh, we had a couple of uh, action items, uh, Town of Parker, Maintenance IGA. We we're just trying to uh, firm up the roles and responsibilities of Parker and E-470, who's responsible for what, um, has never happened. Uh, so I think we're the first, and hopefully E-470 follows that along the, uh, the roadway. Uh, Aurora had a waterline easement, so we did that. And we, uh, we brought out our draft strategic plan, bless you. Um, so we are going to review that, and we're going to provide comment to, uh, to staff, and we're going to uh, continue along that process to create transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dyack. Uh, Fast Tracks, uh, Director Bill Van Meter. Thank you. I have a few items regarding Fast Tracks. Last night, the RTD Board of Directors considered and then passed a resolution regarding the RTD Board commitment for finishing Fast Tracks and supporting the peak service plan for Northwest Rail. Prior to that action, during public comment, there were seven elected officials who addressed the RTD board from the Northwest Rail Corridor, including Directors Jones and Peck. And I'll note that, as he noted earlier, Executive Director Rex was also in attendance at the meeting. I'd like to give a real, an attempt at a real quick app of what that uh, resolution is about. Um, it expresses the board's acknowledgement of RTD's responsibility to complete the unfinished fast tracks corridors and its intention to do so in as expeditious a manner as possible. 
Um, the board directs staff to investigate reasonable cost-saving measures and to propose funding mechanisms to construct and operate the unfinished fast tracks corridors with a report of steps taken to appropriately move forward to be provided within two months. So staff has direction to report back to the RTD board on financing measures for all the unfinished fast track corridors within two months. Further, um, the resolution dictates that staff explore, fund, and facilitate construction and operation measure for the unfinished Northwest Rail Corridor looking at the peak service plan um, and presenting a report outlining proposed steps to appropriately move forward with that plan also within two months. The peak service plan is um, an idea that we've been, we at RTD have been working with stakeholders on for a while, and that is a limited startup type service along the corridor with three inbound trips to Denver Union Station from Longmont each morning and three outbound trips each afternoon, which presumably would um, mitigate a lot of the investment costs necessary compared to the full service plan that Fast Tracks envision. So we'll be exploring those two items. That was the long update. The short updates are Next Friday, April 26th, uh, the G-Line opens, serving Denver, Arvada, and Wheat Ridge. Following on the heels of that on May 17th, the Southeast Rail Extension, or the EFR Extension to Ridgegate Parkway in Lone Tree and Douglas County is opening. So that concludes my <laughs> update. And didn't you do free rides on the G-Line for how long? Indeed, uh, that was another action the board took last night that was approving two weeks of free rides on the G-Line um, as an attempt of recognition regarding the Pain? Patience. There you go. I like that word. Patience. Much better word than others. Patience shown by the community. So the first two weeks of operations just on the G-Line um, will be free of charge. And we have this fun little place called Old Town, so everyone's welcome. All righty. Moving right along on to informational items. Dr. Cog score card report for one strategic objective and one associated performance measures. You can read on that. That is uh, attachment H. Our next meeting is May 15th. Um, any matters by the members? Seeing none, we're adjourned.